Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, for the second time today, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome the folks from Universal Laser Inc. They're the manufacturer of, uh, of two of the laser machines in our lab, uh, uh, our lab being the uh, Microsoft Research Hardware Devices Group. And I'm Mike Sinclair, and I'm director of that uh, very small group. Um, as I said before, the, uh, once we got our laser cutter from these from this uh, great company uh, about nine years ago. Um, there haven't been too many days it hasn't been used. As a matter of fact, uh, I can attest it gets used more than a screwdriver in the lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wish I had had that growing up because, you know, forget about going to the toy store and buying toys, just make your own toys, uh, literally. I think those of you who have, who have uh, uh, used a laser cutter, or ours in our shop, or I think there are a couple others around, scattered around uh, campus, know how versatile they are. Uh, and I'm constantly finding ways of, of uh, violating the, the rules and regulations on, on their use and finding other ways of using the, the laser cutter for making other different, making other things. And it doesn't do very good tattoos, believe me. So <laughs> don't do that. So um, we're, this is the second in the series. Um, Joe Hillman uh, from uh, Universal Laser Inc. is uh, head of the uh, or manager of the Advanced Material Processing Center uh, in Scottsdale, Ar Arizona, and, and uh, he grew up through the, the trials and tribulations at MIT uh, in the material science, uh, and is here to tell us about. Uh, let's see, the second is uh, laser interaction with materials and laser applications. Joe, thanks. Okay. I'm glad to see uh, all, all the laser users in the, in the audience. Our, our, our goal is to uh, give you a little bit more information about the lasers and how they work and, and hopefully in, in inspire you to, to use them for, uh, uh, for more and more applications. Um, so as Mike, as Mike mentioned, we talked a little bit about the, the, the physics that make uh, lasers possible and the, uh, uh, the physical components of the laser itself. Uh, in this section, we're going to uh, uh, broaden that discussion to the to the components of the laser system itself. The laser, of course, is the the, the source of the energy, but we need a, a, a motion system and a control system to make it uh, useful to us. Uh, so we'll, we'll we'll cover those over the next hour, <coughs> and then starting at 11, we'll talk about uh, uh, how the beam, how the laser beam itself interacts with the materials we're interested in, and what sorts of applications we can apply that that laser beam capability to. So here's an overview of the, the, the laser system. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of point to the screen and then we'll, we'll go to the, the, the laser itself. It's, uh, it, it, it's nice to have the laser itself here, but I think it's going to be difficult to see for most of the folks uh, in the audience. But just as an overview, I'm going to kind of walk you through this, this photograph first because it's, it's a photograph of an actual system. But then we'll go to a schematic and you'll be able to see a little bit more what, what, what parts I'm talking about. So the, this is the bed of the laser system where the, 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 the workpiece would reside. The laser is in the back, in this plane back here. The path of the beam would be along the, the, the length of the laser to a mirror here. It turns a corner, uh, hits another mirror, turns a corner, <coughs> hits another mirror, turns a corner, and goes down to the workpiece. So I'll show you that in the, in, in, in the schematic in a little bit more detail. So this is turned around the other way. So here's the, here's the door of the laser system. This is the laser itself. It's, it's just a box on the actual system. Here's the door we saw open before. On the actual system, the laser looks something like this. This is a 50 watt laser. Um, 10 watt lasers are the smallest we make. They're considerably smaller. They're about that big. And, uh, 75 watt laser is the largest we make and then lasers can be combined on a system. We can put two, two lasers on a system so we can actually put two 75 watt lasers on a system and get uh, 150 watts of, of, of laser power. So I, meant, I mentioned the beam path. So the laser beam, of course, 
comes straight out of the laser, so it relies on mirrors to get to the final workpiece. Uh, hits a mirror, turns a corner, and comes into the system itself, into the cavity where the workpiece is located. Then it hits the first moving mirror. Uh, this mirror is, is on, the, uh, on the gantry. It's mounted to the end of the gantry. So as the, as the gantry moves back and forth in this direction, the mirror is moving with it. And then this is the, uh, the final optics, which usually contains a, a mirror and the final focusing lens. So the mirror here and the final focusing lens. Uh, we call that the carriage. This moves back and forth on the gantry, so the mirror and the, the final focusing optic are also moving back and forth to guide the beam to where, to, to where we need it to be, across our cut path or across our marking path. And then uh, and finally we've got the, the, the work table that can come in, in, in various varieties be, depending on the application that you're targeting and, uh, and, and the work piece, the, the plastic or, or metal or glass piece that uh, uh, that's the target of the laser processing. So to show you the, the, the same thing here, we looked at the, the laser. There's a, uh, a turning mirror uh, inside the laser, and, uh, and that mirror is outside of the, the, the working cavity itself. Um, in this plane here, there's a, a window that keeps the, the smoke and debris from the material that you're processing out of the, out of the laser uh, itself. Um, this is the gantry that moves back and forth to give us our, our X motion. And then the carriage moves back and forth on the gantry to give, us, to give us Y motion. So the first moving mirror is at the end of this gantry, and uh, the second moving mirror is inside of this carriage. And I'll just pull this off really quick. You won't be able to see much detail, but this is the the, the, the final uh, focusing optics. This is the, the high power density focusing optics. So it's got a, the collimator that we talked about earlier that uh, expands the beam and, and, and recollimates it. Uh, it it uh, bounces off a series of mirrors to give it some, uh, some working distance and then through the final um, focusing optics and down to the, to the work piece. So it, I know it's hard to see the details here because it's a small piece, but we'll look at it up on the screen in a little bit. It's, it's very easy to remove these uh, lenses and mirrors. The other moving mirror that we talked about is just on a clip here. So uh, we make them easy to access for a reason, and that's because there, there is smoke and debris um, in, in, inside this working area because the, the materials that we're processing with the laser were basically combusting. Uh, and it, it's important to keep those optics clean to keep them functioning at their uh, at their optimum level. So we we recommend you know whenever you start a job just to pop those optics out, uh, clean them with a little bit of alcohol and a and a piece of lens paper. So the window that's coming through from the back mm -hmm. um, does that also have to be cleaned regularly or is that yeah that should be cleaned also yeah and it's easy to access. It's easy to access. It's difficult to take off, but you don't have to take that one off to clean it. And you only have to clean one side of it, the side that's exposed to the smoke. Okay, airflow is, airflow is critical too. You want to keep the, the, the lenses clean, but one of the best ways to keep the, the, the lenses and the mirrors clean is to have a good, uh, uh, healthy airflow. Generally speaking, uh, the airflow is in through the, through the front of the machine. So the airflow comes in through the front, um, and it's exhausted through the back. And uh, the airflow does a, 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 a couple things. Um, you know, for, for, for one thing, it, you want to exhaust that, uh, that smoke, because the smoke is uh, you know, components of the, uh, of the material that you're cutting. For example, if you're cutting a, a acrylic, which is polymethyl methacrylate, one of the components of that effluent is going to be the, uh, the, the methacrylate uh, monomer, um, which if you don't exhaust it readily, it's just going to condense back on your workpiece and, and solidify and you'll have kind of a hazy surface on your workpiece. So you want to get that stuff, you want to motivate it out the back of the system and into the filter as, as efficiently as possible. And the other reason, of course, is uh, you know, he health, health and safety. You, want to, uh, uh, you don't want to be uh, inhaling that. You want to get it out of the out of the room. You want to have this area completely exhausted before you raise the cover and and reach in to get your um, to get your workpiece out. 
Um, there are a couple of ways to handle the exhaust. Uh, once, it's, once it's out of the system, the, the, the systems that are in the lab have an exhaust uh, to the outside. Um, we also make systems like this that have uh, filter carts. Uh, I won't show you details, but basically there's a, there's a HEPA filter in here. So uh, there's air, airflow, sorry about that, airflow through a pre-filter, and then underneath this pre-filter, uh, take my word for it, there's a HEPA filter, it's a little heavy. <laughs> and then the exhaust goes through that HEPA filter, and then the next element in here is a, uh, is a cartridge containing activated charcoal. It's got about 25 pounds of activated charcoal, so it removes uh, any odor and any, any chemical residue from the air. So this can be exhausted right into a room. So this is handy for, uh, for example, uh, architectural modelers who might be in a, you know, a big downtown building that doesn't uh, offer the capability to exhaust to the outside. So we need to manage the exhaust flow to keep the workpiece clean, to keep the, the, the optics clean, and also to keep, uh, you know, to keep our, our, our working environment uh, uh, safe. Let's go into a, a little more detail on the, on the laser path. So here's our, our laser cartridge in the back of the system. We've got the RF electronics that supply the energy to, uh, to the two parallel plate electrodes. And then those electrodes, uh, as we uh, cover, covered a little earlier, the electrodes are, uh, are stimulating the gas inside the, the laser and, and, and providing that uh, stimulated emission that leads to the laser beam. Um, the beam, as we mentioned, hits the first mirror, goes through that beam window, hits the first uh, moving mirror that's on the end of the gantry, hits the final moving mirror that's on our, on our carriage, and then goes through the focusing lens. So there, there are... Uh, uh, a, a few aspects of the focusing lens that we want to understand in a little more detail so we can uh, optimize the usefulness of the laser for us. So we're just going to zero in on, the, on, this, on this area here. So here's the beam coming into the focusing le uh, lens. Uh, one characteristic is the, the, the focal length of the particular lens. Um, another is the spot size. The spot size is um, the, the diameter of the waist of the beam. So the beam's going to converge from its uh, starting diameter, which is about eight thousandth of an inch. It's going to converge uh, not to a, a singularity, but to, to what's the, the, the term in optics is the waist, of, the waist of the beam. So it converges. There's a, a, a short distance where, uh, where it's in focus, and then it diverges again. And that short distance where it's in focus is the depth of the focus the depth of focus. Yeah? So you mentioned uh, earlier in person that you, uh, when one of the lenses initially uh, broadens the uh, light beam coming in. So if you were to have an even broader beam, you could narrow the spot size even farther, it appears. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. That's true. Well, I'll, I'll show, uh, I think it's the next one, show a little bit more about how that works. But that's the basic idea. If it's, if it's broader, it's just the nature of the optics. If it's broader, you can focus it down more dramatically. So the three characteristics we want to remember are pretty straightforward. Focal length, uh, spot size, depth of focus, and they're all interrelated. Okay, so when you typically set up the laser, um, you, you're actually setting the top of the material at the, at the minimum, at the waist? I, you can, and typically that's what you do. Okay. Uh, for a, a thicker material, you might want to set it so that the waist is in the middle of the material. If you're cutting like a two-inch piece of foam, yeah. You don't necessarily want it to be focused at the top, and then it's going to be really divergent at the bottom. You may want to set it so it's focused somewhere in the middle of the material. So, so like the autofocus, though, sets it to the top, I presume? Yeah, that would set it for the top. And then you just have to adjust the distance if you want to focus down into the material. Sometimes you want to cut a material two and two passes. So you'd start it at the top and do one pass that cuts halfway through, and then focus it uh, partway down um, and do the rest of the cut. But typically, you focus it on the top of the material. That would be the typical thing. And that is what our focus tool does, is, 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 is focus it on the top. So here are the, the, the various uh, standard optics that we've got uh, available. Um, we characterize the lenses by their focal length. So uh, if the lens says 1.5 on it, that's got a 1.5-inch focal length. Uh, our standard 
lens is a 2.0 lens. It's got a, a 2.0 inch focal length up to uh, a 4.0, which has a 4 inch focal length. Um, so as the focal length increases, you notice the, uh, the spot size also, also increases. So um, 1.5 has about a 3,000 um, spot size up to a 12,000 spot size for the, for the 4.0. Um, so if you just looked at that, you would think, you know, the 1.5 is the most useful, but there's a, there's a trade-off there. Notice that as the, as the spot size increases, uh, so does the depth of focus. Um, and you'd like to have uh, a, a large depth of focus and a small spot size, but the optics just don't, don't work that way. If you've got a small spot size, then by the nature of the optics, you've got a, uh, you've got a small depth of focus. Um, so the, the, the smaller spot size lens is, is, is good for detailed marking, if you want to get very fine text on a surface or a very fine engraving pattern, or for cutting thin materials where you want a very small kerf, but you don't need a big, a, a big depth of focus to work with. And then, of course, the 4.0, it, it actually has a couple uses. The, you, you can take advantage of that large depth of focus to cut through uh, thicker materials with, you'll, you'll actually end up with a narrower kerf if you use this 4.0 for, say, a two-inch piece of foam, then if you tried to use the 1.5, because even though the 1.5 has a smaller spot size, it's going to have a bigger divergence through the thickness of the material. Uh, something like the 4.0 lens also has, uh, has uh, usefulness if you've got a surface that's got a lot of undulations in the surface. Say, say if you're engraving on this area and this area and there's a big hump in the middle. You know, if you've got a piece that's got... Uh, uh, parts that stick out and you just don't want to have to drive the laser around those parts that longer working distance is use useful. So how much does it actually, does the beam width vary over the depth of focus? It, it, I assume you have some spec that it's like 10% or something. Or it, it, it doesn't vary uh, substantially. Um, I can't quote you a number. Yeah, assuming that yeah, the waist kind of does that. <laughs> It, yeah, it's kind of an hourglass. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I assume there's some variation. It's just, but there must be, you know, I, I mean, you know, kind of like a 10 to 90 percent rise time in some. It, it, it's it's a defined amount. It's it's it kind it's kind of a standard uh, figure in in, in optics. Um, we'll have to send you that that information. Because yeah, I, I notice when I'm like trying to apply pieces that, yeah, the the angle that we get often causes yeah. problems. <laughs> And it's defined exactly that way, you know, from the, from the minimum it diverges well, actually, up or down. It goes the opposite way. You get a smaller curve at the bottom than you do yes. at the top. So you're losing energy as you go through. But yeah, that's very true. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I always, if I, that's the problem, I always focus about a third of the way down. I get a pretty, a third a pretty straight edge. So those are the, the, the standard optics. Now, we, you know, we saw a need, we had a lot of requests from customers uh, to, to create a smaller spot size for a couple of reasons. One is just to, uh, to engrave with finer detail or cut thin materials with a narrower kerf, uh, but also to create a, a higher energy density with, uh, with a standard CO2 laser. So that's when we created this uh, high power density focusing optic. So we've got a, uh, an extra lens here that's a, a special lens that's it's, it's called a beam expander or a collimator or sometimes people call them both. Uh, some people call it a beam expander telescope because it has that collimation property to it. But the, the beam from the, the laser comes into that, that first lens. It's expanded. In our case, we expanded about 50%. Um, and then it's collimated. So it's not just diverging when it comes to the beam expander. It expands it and then, then recollimates it. So you've got a bigger, uh, a bigger beam coming into the focusing lens, which allows us to focus it down to a, to a smaller spot, which... Uh, the natural consequences of that is that it's got a, a lower depth of focus also. We'll just add that to our, to our table here. So now we've got a, an HPDFO, which is, we weren't happy with the three-letter acronym, so we had to go with a five-letter acronym. We're working on a six-letter acronym, but that, that's not going to be till next year. Um, so it's got a, 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 the same focal length as the, as the 2.0 lens, but a much smaller spot size about a thousandths or about, about uh, 40 microns. And the depth of focus is also smaller, about, uh, about 30 thousandths. Uh, one interesting property uh, is that that gives us uh, sufficient power density to put a, a mark on, uh, on any, any ferrous uh, metal 
and uh, the mechanism for the marking. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the third section. But we're actually doing a surface oxidation there. We're creating um, uh, ver various oxides that are um, related to the material. Stainless steel is particularly interested, interesting because you've got, you've got iron, you've got nickel, you've got cobalt in the, in the stainless steel, so you're creating different mixtures of oxides. Depending on the, the, the temperature you get the surface to, and you can actually create uh, colors by, by playing around with the, uh, the, the power density. Um, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll save going into more depth on that for the, uh, the application section. But uh, we, we can mark uh, uh, stainless steel, we can mark uh, titanium as a material that can be marked if we've got that, that power density. Um, not all metals, but uh, you know, a few selected materials that grow oxides at a relatively um, low temperature. Um, uh, difficulties with highly reflective and highly thermally conductive materials like, uh, like copper and aluminum can't touch those with a CO2 laser. They just dissipate heat too, too quickly and can't, uh, can't heat them up. So those are the lens options, and it, it gives you a, a lot of capability for uh, you know, processing a, a, a wide variety of materials. Um, so let's look at the, uh, at, the, at the platform options. And this, this isn't meant to be an advertisement. I just wanted to show you the sorts of capabilities that are, that are available. Uh, what we're showing here is, is, is this system here. So these are, these are smaller systems with, um, that, the, the smallest actually is a, is a 12 by 6 inch table that we offer. And you know, uh, uh, similar capabilities are, are available elsewhere. This small system uh, has 10 to 30. 30 watt uh, laser. It's got the filter cart that we talked about with the, the three stage um, filtration, which is meant for in, indoor use where you don't have access to, uh, um, to an outside exhaust. I'm not going to step through all these. This is sort of a, a mid range la laser with a 18 by 32 inch table, and it's got the capability to hold up to uh, a 75 watt laser. And then uh, uh, a fairly large system. This has a, a pass-through. You can see the side doors are open. So it's actually amenable to uh, uh, an index, indexing sort of system where you can index materials in, process them, and then index them out the other side for uh, me medium to high volume <coughs> manufacturing. This one uh, can, can hold two lasers, so you can get up to 150 watts of, uh, of laser power. A single beam, or? yeah, they're combined into a single beam, and they're actually one of one of them is rotated with respect to the other one, so the phases are orthogonal. That gives you much better uh, better cutting uniformity. The the single beam has a little bit of uh, eccentricity to it, so um, cuts um, aren't aren't completely uniform. The, the y direction is is slightly narrower than the x direction. Uh, so if you combine two degrees and, and rotate them, you get a much rounder beam profile. Any other questions? I didn't mention when I started, but we're, we're trying to encourage uh, uh, conversation. So if you had any questions or even comments, just, uh, just let me know. Uh, we're going to make this as, as useful as possible for, for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Uh, rough prices on each of those. R rough prices? Ballpark. Uh, I got to figure out how to get back there. Um, I, I guess the real answer is I have no idea. But <laughs> the, 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 the small ones. Uh, if you want, I mean, I can. <laughs> yeah, Chris is better call. Well, well probably uh, at the lowest end system with a very low wattage, uh, relatively stripped down, ten to fifteen thousand. Um, going all the way up to uh, just under $100,000 with the, the largest system okay. fully loaded. Okay, we, we, we mentioned earlier there are different sorts of uh, work surfaces available, and I don't have a very good, actually I can pull this out. The, I don't have a very good picture of the, 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 the flat aluminum work surface, but I can pull this one out here fairly quickly. And there's not much to it. It's just a piece of brushed uh, aluminum. But this is the surface you would use uh, for marking. 
it's just a flat piece of aluminum, I don't know, eighth of an inch thick, three sixteenths, um, with a couple rulers on it so you can get your piece aligned, your workpiece aligned. Um, so you, you wouldn't use that for cutting very, very thick material because the, the, the problem is when the laser beam cuts through, it's going to reflect right off the aluminum and, and, and send the beam you know, right straight back up through your workpiece. You'll get a lot of melting on the, on the bottom. You'll get more charring than you want. The beam, when it hits, it's going to uh, scatter, so you'll have a very divergent beam path, and you just won't be able to control your cut very well. But it is used for cutting uh, thin material. For example, uh, there, there are laminating adhesives that are, that are very uh, popular that can be cut very effectively on, on this table. But it's, it's more often used for, uh, for just putting a mark uh, on the surface of material. This is a little bit hard to see, but we've got Microsoft engraved in, the, in one side of this plastic cube. So if you're just trying to put a mark, an identifying mark, say it's a, a part number or a, you know, experimental prototype, not for resale or <laughs> property of Chris or something like that, uh, some kind of identifying or, uh, uh, or, or decorative mark on the surface, that would be the right, the right table to use. Um, uh, especially for marking, um, usually your, your line width is, 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 is absolutely critical. If you're putting, if you're putting text down, you, your, your eye is very critical of the text size variations as you, as you go across a, a page. And this, this flat aluminum table is, uh, is going to be a bit more stable than the, uh, than the honeycomb cutting table that we're going we're gonna to look at next. Um, you can use the, the cutting table for in, engraving, but if it's a really critical engraving job, you probably this flat aluminum table is, is, is the right one. Um, for cutting, probably, you know, in, in, the, in the hardware lab, this probably is the, the table that gets the, the most use. Um, there's a, an exhaust port in the back here because, again, managing the exhaust flow is, 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 is key. And the material in the center here, it might be hard to tell from the, the photo, but it's just ex expanded metal. It's a, it's, a, it's an aluminum honeycomb, about an inch thick, uh, just very thin, almost foil uh, support members for the, uh, for the workpiece. And, th and this is what it looks like if you look at it in, in cross-section. Here's the honeycomb part of the table. It's made so you can put your workpiece on top, and then as you cut through, you're pulling airflow, you're pulling your exhaust flow down through the cut. Uh, so the exhaust doesn't have to work its way back up through the cut where it you know, could cause some... Uh, some problems, aesthetic problems, if not, if not physical problems. So you still have your exhaust flow path over the top surface of the, the, the workpiece and out through the plenum, so that keeps the top of the work surface clean. But you've also got a, uh, an exhaust flow path down through your workpiece, through the cutting table, and, and out through the same plenum. There's also a rotary fixture if you're cutting uh, or, or, or marking uh, cylindrical parts. You put the part uh, in, this, in this fixture, it clamps in just like it would clamp into a lathe, and instead of having, um, um, instead of having Y motion, you've got a, a, an angular motion imparted by this rotary fixture. So the, uh, I can kind of show you here, the, the, the carriage will still move back and forth when you're engraving, but instead of the gantry moving back and forth, the gantry is going to stay stable and you're going to get rotary, you're going to get theta motion through the, through the rotary. So you can engrave, engrave or cut on a, a round or cylindrical object with that. Do you have anything uh, for uh, more complex surfaces? So let's say we want to engrave the surface of a mouse. Um, I think what we would need would be a, a, a better Z control. Right now we set our Z to a you know, certain height for a certain job. And uh, if, we, if we had the capability, we, we look for that in our lab a lot. If we had the, the, yes. the capability to control Z over time, that, that would be a handy capability. We don't have that currently. Um, but it would be a useful feature, definitely. Um, so we talked about the, the, the need to control uh, airflow. So, and we talked about the general airflow through the system. We've got a, a, a couple devices, and again, you, I'm, I'm showing you uh, Universal's offerings, but ge generally speaking for a laser system, these are the kinds of components you're going to want to have, uh, have access to. 
So this is a, this is a cone-shaped feature. I'll show you schematically how it works too. But this is a cone-shaped feature that's going to direct airflow uh, concentric to the, to the laser beam, out, ar ar around the laser beam, and directly down, down a cut. Um, it attaches right to the bottom of the carriage, uh, maybe that long. Oh, the, well, the length is dictated by the focal length of the lens you're using. Um, screws a hose into the side of uh, into the side of this carriage, which is where it picks up air. So the air comes through the hose into the cone and just squirts right down onto the workpiece. Uh, so you'll use this for cutting. So if this is a piece of uh, some polymer material, we've got a laser beam. Uh, directed right down at the surface of the material to cut through it. Uh, the cone is, is blowing air concentrically around the laser beam. Uh, so as we cut through, it's going to pull that airflow right, right through the cut. Uh, very useful for cutting thick materials, especially when you want to um, make sure that the, that the cutting surface is, is cooled as quickly as possible after it's being cut. Uh, for materials like uh, Delrin or acrylic, that uh, acrylic especially that tends to melt, it's important to cool it fairly quickly so you don't get a large heat affected zone, uh, large large melt area. Um, I'd say the most Im the, the, the most important effect is just drawing that effluent away, but the cooling effect is there too. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to your last point. I mm -hmm. should have mentioned it before. Somebody had told me that there was some software that allowed. You know, by the varying the power of the laser that would allow you to do more 3D contouring. Is that something that you know of? Or? Yeah, we can do 3D contouring uh, de definitely. If you put a, uh, if, if you download a graphic that is a grayscale graphic, you can set the software to engrave 90% grayscale would be a deeper uh, level than 10% than grayscale. And you can get some pretty dramatic, uh, dramatic depth profiles th through the through the system. You can get a you know, quarter, quarter of an inch depth variation easily uh, in a piece of Delrin or, or wood or, or acrylic. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's embedded in the software that you've got. Oh, it does have that? Yeah. You just have to have a, a, a grayscale image. I, I believe we've got a sample of that too. And you can change the uh, characteristic profile of Depth versus power. Yes. This is to get software in order to do that. You can do pretty complex images that way. Um, another sort of uh, air assist that, that we call the back sweep. You know, again, it attaches to the carriage. We've got the same sort of hose to to, to carry. Um, air to the final nozzle. This is the final nozzle, and the idea here is. Uh, more, more for engraving. We don't want the, uh, the air to go through a cut because generally we were using this for, for engraving. We want to direct the air perpendicular to the laser beam and just help motivate that exhaust uh, away from the area that we're engraving and off the, off the workpiece. So here's our, our workpiece again. Laser, in this case we're just engraving the top surface and we've got the, the backflow just p pushing more air ac across the workpiece and out the exhaust. Okay, we'll switch, uh, switch gears a little bit from the, the, the physical components of the system to exactly how we control the, uh, the laser beam. So there, there, there are two uh, basic pulsing controls, and those are the repetition rate that we measure in, in pulses per inch, or PPI. Uh, we can control it from uh, 100 pulses per linear inch across the surface up to 1,000 pulses per linear inch across the surface. So just, just to give you a better feel for, for pulse rate, if we say, for ex let's say that this represents uh, 100 pulses per inch. If that were the case, then this would be 200 pulses per inch. So that it's, it's pulsing twice in the same distance that this is pulsing once. So we're pulsing it you know, more times per inch. The, the second control is, is pulse duration. Or, or what you might call duty cycle in a, in a motor. Um, we actually measure this as, as percent power. We're, we're varying the power density, but we're not literally changing the output power of the laser. We're changing the, the, the amount of time that the laser is on. So if, if, if we said, again, that this was, 
or similarly, I should say, if we said that this was 50%, uh, which, which kind of looks like it's, it's on for just as much time as it's off, then this would be 25%. It's on for you know, half of what this on time was, and it's, and it's off for uh, three quarters of the time. So this would be 25% pulse duration or 25% power. Power literally isn't pulsing at all. It's literally on all the time. Yes, that's right. It will. Uh, it, it it'll fire. I'll, I'll I'll be able to explain it better in the in the next group. It'll it'll fire, so you'll get you'll get a pulse, but it it won't really go down to zero. Okay, does that make sense? It's pretty straightforward. We on our systems we have names that aren't quite intuitive, so. <laughs> um, but, that, but that's the basic concept. So let, let's look at what actually happens to the, to the laser output, because what I, what I showed you is actually more representative of the signal to the RF generator, which is how we control the laser. So the, if we want to turn the laser on, we send a, a signal to the RF generator that tells it to turn on. It sends a, a, a 40 megahertz uh, energy to the, to the electrodes, which create the plasma and generate stimulated emission and output the laser. So we turn the generator on. At the, at the instant we turn it on, uh, the laser output, the optical output of the laser, begins to ramp up. It tends to overshoot, usually overshoots by about 20 to 30 percent. Uh, and then it stabilizes at the rated output of the laser. So if this is a 100-watt laser, this, this represents 100 watts output. This is probably going to be a 120 to 130-watt peak. That whole on and, on and stabilization, I should say, lasts about 100 microseconds from the time it turns on to the time it stabilizes. Then it's going to be, it's going to be stable. In, in this case, let's, let's call this 100 watts. It's going to be stable at 100 watts for the duration of your on cycle. So if we said 50%, said this would be... 50% of the, 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 the overall uh, repetition rate. When you tell it to turn off, when you tell the generator to turn off, it doesn't turn off instantly. There's a decay time that's about 150 microseconds before it's completely off. So what's going to happen if you send it to 100 percent? There, you know, there's going to be a, a, an instant here where it's flicked off, but it's going to... So you're going you're to get this pulse, uh, but it, it's not going to decay completely to zero. Before it gets to zero, you're going to be turning it back on again. Mm -hmm. Mike? Uh, you said as you turn around the corner and whatnot, you actually slow down the, the, the mechanical sweeping of the beam, tangential speed. Yes. And you, you have to control uh, to lower the, the power. How do you do that if you're at 100 percent? You actually uh, uh, lower the percent duty cycle as you're going around corners? We don't lower the duty cycle, but we, we lower the, the number of pulses per inch. I'm, I'm sorry, we lower the number, we lower the frequency to keep the pulses per linear inch but, constant. But you're saying if it's 100% power, it's pretty much on the whole time. So all of a sudden frequency doesn't mean anything, right? So how, how do you modulate the power when you're going around the corners? Because if, if it's on most of the time, then frequency really doesn't control the power that much, right? Because the off time is so short. All, yeah, all you're controlling is these, is these peaks. So you're... you're if you, if you lower the pulse rate, you're lowering the number of the number of on peaks that you get. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we don't we don't turn down the uh, kind of look, looking over at my helpers here. I'm pretty sure we don't modulate the duty cycle. I, I'm pretty sure it's just the pulses per inch we modulate as we go around the corners. Sure and also, you let me I'll, I'll verify that to you because I want to give you an uh, accurate answer. Yeah, uh, 70 inches per second, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, kilohertz. Uh, or a thousand pulses per second. That's seventy. That's seventy thousand pulses per second. Yep. Which is around uh, eight. Uh, eight microseconds. Um, so, uh, Twelve microseconds. But you're talking about two hundred and fifty microseconds here. So something's got to give when you're going at. A, at probably a, a, a linear line, right? Mm -hmm. a, a straight X or Y line, you're, you're going at 70 inches per second. So you don't have much playroom 
in your diagram here, if you have 100 microsecond turn on, 150 turn off, and yet your pulses need to be metered out at uh, 12 microseconds. So there must be some other thing that you internally manipulate yeah, to, uh, you know, to control your power. I, I know there's a, yeah, lot, a bunch of tables in the in the, yeah, 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 it's probably the magic of the, the edits. Uh, there's yeah. there's things that you know even even aren't uh, revealed to us, so to speak. But we know it works. <laughs> it does. Yeah. I'll have to think about that. If, if, if that's the case, then there's a problem here. Yeah. I, I don't know if I've got a number wrong. Uh, you know, th this should be long with respect to, to the on and off, ideally. Uh, that's like 500 microseconds, which is two kilohertz, not 70 kilohertz. Right. Yes. Because it sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Could, let's let's, let's can, look into that. Can you help me understand why it's like 100 100 microseconds uh, to turn on? I mean, you know, what what why? Because RF stuff can turn on much much faster than that. You know. Um, and but you're so, also doing the plasma. Generation. Yeah. That's yeah. So is it the is it the decay that we? What's what's primarily determining the time constant of that hundred ish or hundred and fifty microseconds? Is it is it the decay of the plasma itself, or or do you know where it comes from? It, it, it's yeah. It's, it's not the turning on of the generator. You're right. It's the uh, the, the establishment of the plasma and pulling that uh, population of CO2 molecules into the inversion inversion range. And then, you know, Mike brings up a, a good question here. I've got to make sure I've got these, these numbers right because it doesn't, it doesn't add up if we've got an eight yeah. microsecond pulse it and it takes a hundred to turn on. If it were nanoseconds, it would, it, it would work. But that's a. It might be, it might be something that simple. Yeah, but that's just three orders of magnitude amongst friends. <laughs> Even a couple of orders. Of well, I hope I didn't get that wrong. Yeah, but, but I'll definitely check and. We'll, we'll, we'll get you the correct answer. So you also showed the spot sort of linearly coming down. Yeah, and this is this is greatly exaggerated. Of course, you, would, right. you wouldn't see this if you if you if you pulsed it into a into a workpiece. To follow something similar to a laser output uh, path, that it wouldn't be linearly decaying over the flat region. It would be more or less stable over the flat region. Uh, uh, over a short time scale, it's not because you've you've imparted a lot of heat into the workpiece, and that heat has to dissipate through through the material. So this is really heat dissipation through the material that's decaying linearly. It's hot spot, not not optical spot. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You notice with the new laser, the 75 watt, which is, I think is 82 watts instead of our older 50 watt, we get a much wider curve and. Chris's explanation seemed to pass muster in that we're hitting where the uh, the actual pulse energy is much higher, even though the duty cycle might be might be dropped down. But we're getting uh, about a forty thousandths curve measurable, plus or minus twenty thousandths, and the old system was about plus or minus six thousandths. And uh, we'll just have to take that into account. That seems like quite a bit larger curve for just a 50% increase in power. Yeah, that does sound like a, that, that sounds pretty dramatic. Um, you know, he's, he's right, you know, this is, this is always going to be 50 watts in your old laser and this is always yeah. going to be 75 watts in, in the so current laser. Size. That's yeah. going from 6 to 40 is, uh, is yeah, pretty, pretty big. Cool. So, at least with acrylic. 6 to 20, the, the plus or minus. Yeah. Yes, okay. So okay. 20 or 12 total to 40 total. Yeah, 12 to 40. Okay. We, we, we should check and make okay. sure that the laser is okay. Right. Certainly. But that, that sounds big. A thousand watts when we got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds it sounds like something's a little off. Okay. Yeah, that that's that's big for a 75 laser. Okay. Okay. All right. Don't anyone write these numbers down. Let me check them and I'll. I'll make sure we let everyone know what's correct. <coughs> okay, controlling the motion. This, you know, this is this is pretty simple stuff. We've either got vector motion where we're tra tracing out a particular cut path, 
or we've got raster motion that's primarily used for engraving, 3D engraving, or you know, engraving a, a name or a serial number into a part. Just a few relevant things, you know, how to, how to make use of these motion controls to, uh, uh, to get the most out of the, the laser system. Um, you can, uh, in, a, in, a, in a vector path, you can run at very low pulses per inch and put in a, a perforation. If you're looking at a very thin piece of uh, polymer, for example, or, or, or paper, or even fabric, uh, you can perforate it so you can tear it apart later, or so you can get a, a fold line. Um, Said that the 100, 100 PPI was the lowest PPI. Um, I think I did say that. Um, I think we can pulse. I don't think it's 100. Yeah, I, I, I misspoke on the previous. It might be more, more of a typical uh, number, but we can go lower. Is there a lower limit? Um, there is, uh, yeah, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the software. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I apologize. Sure we, we, sure yeah, we can go lower than 100 because I know we can get pulses to separate. No, but I think you can get below 100 because I've yeah. done that. If you want to make right. like laser perforation yeah. of paper yeah. that it tears really easily, that works for you. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I've done 25 PPI. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, so everything else being equal. Um, if I lower the PPI, I'm going to lower the amount of energy in my workpiece. Is that correct? En energy density, yeah. Yes. Total energy into, this, in, into the workpiece, yep. Yeah. Okay, so if you're going to cut or uh, engrave more deeply, of course, you want to uh, overlap the dots. And depending on the spot size and the, and the PPI, that's going to determine how much overlap you've got. Uh, for raster processing, similar effect. If you want ver very good definition, if you want a you know, very uh, fine pattern, you can overlap the raster lines. Um, if speed is more important, and rastering by nature is a, is a fairly slow process, um, so if you need to go quickly, uh, you can get a wider separation. And uh, you can even separate them completely so you've got in in independent lines. That's, um, that's good for some troubleshooting. Uh, if you think you've got a, a motion system problem, for example, you can make two raster lines that don't overlap and then look at them under the microscope and see how, how much they're converging or diverging over, uh, over, over distance. Okay. So that was the, 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 the second section. Um, next section is going to be on uh, interaction of the, the, the laser with, uh, with various materials and and how we apply that interaction for various applications. But um, we had a lot of good, good discussion. Any other questions or, or comments on this section? You guys had a, a, a lot of really good questions. I'm going to have to go back and do some, uh, some homework. But I'll get, uh, I'll, I'll get the right answers to you, I promise. OK. Well, it's almost 11. Should we take a break, Mike? Okay, we'll take, take a bit of a break and we'll start up again in about 10 minutes.